Now, our next talk is Simulating Universes. Our speaker is Philipp Busch. He's a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute. He used to study at Potsdam at the Leibniz Institute. And as quite a few of you, he's also an angel at the Congress. Uh, He's going to speak about how astrophysics profited from improvements in computational power and what the current understanding of the universe is for this perspective. Please welcome him with a huge round of applause. Hi, so thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the organizers for giving me the chance to talk about this. Uh, actually, last Congress I heard some very interesting talks in this room, and I thought, why not give a talk about an aspect of science that completely relies on huge computers and it couldn't be done otherwise. And um, to show you what I'm, wh where we're going to end up at the end of the talk, I want to show you this video. This is uh, the uh, a modern cosmological simulation, including gas physics and everything, run by a collaboration uh, of astrophysicists from the US and Germany and some other countries. And um, basically, I hope at the end of the talk, you'll be able to understand what you're seeing here and why it's there. Okay. And to get there, as this is a simulation, we need to simulate universes. Um, I couldn't have given this talk without learning a lot from different people. Uh, first of all, I want to mention the top row, my uh, former and current supervisors uh, in Garching and Potsdam, a few friends and colleagues of mine in the second row who helped me prepare this talk, and uh, some more colleagues that provided me with ma material for this talk. And yeah, I mean, science is a group effort, so um, I couldn't have done it without them. Before uh, I really come to the simulations, we first have to s uh, talk about what we are simulating. And so I have to give you a quick introduction into cos cosmology, which is the science of the development of the universe as a whole. So this is, in a certain sense, a neighboring or speciality um, of astrophysics. And there's also going to be a lot of astrophysics in the talk, although we're not going to go very deep into this part. But so let's dive right in. Um, this is, uh, in our community, a very famous plot um, by the Planck collaboration. Planck is a satellite that measures the cosmic microwave background, which I'm going to come to in a second. And this basically has it all in there. Everything that we know, uh, or that we think to know, or that we do know to a large degree, about the, the, how the universe developed is in this plot. We're here today, and because light has a finite speed, we look away and we look into the past, because light from for the way it took some time to reach us. And so we look all the way to the past, and of course we can't look all the way to the Big Bang, but that's where our story starts. And so we have this Big Bang event, uh, which I guess all of you have heard about, and afterwards we have a phase of rapid expansion in which uh, actually quantum mechanical fluctuations are blown up to macroscopic sizes. And it's these fluctuations which perturb an initially homo homogeneous universe and which then bring the structure that we see today, galaxies and so on. And um, after this very rapid expansion, the universe still expands, and as it expands, it cools down, and particles start to form. Um, there's still a lot of light in there, so a lot of photons which interact with these particles. And some of these particles are what we call dark matter, and they don't interact with these light particles, while the rest is the normal matter that we know, so uh, basically uh, protons, neutrons, and later on electrons, and they do interact with light. And uh, because they do interact with light, um, although they attract each other gravitationally, um, they do not form structure yet. But dark matter, because it's decoupled uh, from the photons, can already start forming structure. And that's one of the hints why there has to be something like dark matter, because if there wouldn't be dark matter, there wouldn't have been enough time today to see any structure in the universe as something like galaxies and so on. Okay, then um, stuff, the universe further expands, uh, the contents further cool down, and at one point um, the universe um, is so big and so dilute that um, 
the normal matter and photons stop interacting with each other. And at that point, the photons can just fly freely, and at some point later on reaching us, after being redshifted by a lot of much, redshifted is um, so the wavelength increases, red, red light has a longer wavelength, so we call this redshifting, and uh, that basically happens because the universe is expanding under the light as it travels to us. And um, because of this redshift, it reaches us as cosmic microwave radiation, cosmic mi the cosmic microwave background, um, but at this point it's not a microwave yet, it's a shorter wavelength. Anyway, the dark matter um, has already formed structure. The gas streams into the structure and starts forming stars and galaxies. And uh, more and more structure forms the longer the universe exists, and so stuff further clumps, and um, it becomes less and less homogeneous. And uh, this is this dark matter structure in purple, but the structure we actually see are the galaxies. And the galaxies inhabit this rich dark matter structure in uh, basically just as tracers. So we don't see the full structure like that, but we only see some light bulbs, if you want to say, on this tree or on this network of dark matter structure. Okay. Now, uh, this is a picture or a depiction of the cosmic microwave background. And uh, so this is a full sky map. This is basically all around us. This was measured by Planck. Again, this is from 2013. Um, so it's a satellite that basically me measures how, how the uh, cosmic microwave radiation reaches us, and um, it can calculate what's called a black body temperature or a black body um, yeah, um, yeah, temperature for each point, but that's not really important. What I want to show you here, that, so there is some structure in there, um, but you only see the structure because we subtracted a value 100,000 times bigger than the variations. So for the most part, the cosmic microwave background is one temperature, but there are tiny fluctuations, as I uh, show down here, it's 0.001% uh, variation on this one temperature. And uh, these variations are very cl close to what mathematicians would call a Gaussian random field. And um, this, is, um, this was predicted this way, this, so this was predicted by our cosmological model. Uh, whether there are some tiny deviations is actually an interesting current question. Um, but because it's a Gaussian random field, there's one statistic that describes it fully, in a statistical sense, uh, and that's the power spectrum. So basically, what kind of, how strong are the fluctuations on a given scale? And it's not really important that you understand why this curve looks this way. What is important here, and which I would like you um, to see, is that, um, so in red we see the data points, we see what we measure from this map, and in green is a fit, on, or is a cosmological model with uh, six free parameters, only six, and these six free parameters give us a predicted power spectrum that fits these data points to this degree of accuracy. So the green line is the, is the uh, mean value, and then the green area is basically uncertainty on this level. And um, unfortunately, this works so well. People would love if it wouldn't work so well, because then there would be more to talk about. But um, for the last 30 years, it has worked really well, and people are trying to break it. And, um, Sarah Conrad is going to give a talk about um, how people might find some problems in there and what, what can be done or what, what other avenues can be explored uh, on day four at 2 p.m. or 2.10 p.m. So I would definitely also check this talk out and learn more about this. Um, okay, from this fit, we get uh, the following, um, yeah, makeup of the universe once at the time of the, uh, of the CMB, where the CMB was emitted, and then today. And at the time of the CMB, there was emitted atoms and dark matter, which don't really change in absolute amount, but in relative amount, uh, where the most part of the universe, then we had neutrinos and photons, and because of the expansion of the universe and the redshifting, they decrease in basically energy content, and atoms and dark matter still stay the same, but then there's something weird called dark energy, uh, which drives the accelerated expansion, as we know, since the late 90s of the universe. And, yeah, which, again, Sarah Conrad will also uh, talk much more in depth about. Okay, so, um, so far I mostly talked about gravity only, and I talked a bit about gas flowing, and that also, that's also sets the stage for our simulations. The most important thing we have to talk about is gravity, and that's the, we can't do simulations of the universe without gravity. The second thing is hydrodynamics, and we can already do 
quite good simulations without hydrodynamics, but in the end, if we want to look at the smaller scales, we need hydrodynamics. And then there are many more things, radiation and many more things that might also appear later on in the talk, but they're not that important, and I don't have the time to actually um, talk about how we incorporate them in simulations. So, uh, well, the first question, I guess, is why do, we sim why do we do simulations at all? And, I mean, yes, there are a lot of analytical models, but they only take us so far, and we have a problem. The things in space are pretty big, so we can't really set them up in a lab. And so if we want to play around with things, we kind of... Um, yeah, have to see what we can actually observe with our ground-based telescopes and nowadays also satellites. And then, I mean, we do have a large amount of uh, other physical theories that we know about, and so we, have my, so we might have some idea how these things work in space. And um, then we can calculate what they should do, which is our simulation, and then we see whether they actually do that. And our simulation itself takes some input, and um, then uh, we have some algorithm that is inspired by physics, which basically incorporates our physical laws and then predicts some output. And whether our output matches the observation then tells us whether uh, we're on the right track or not. Okay, but uh, what we need one more step for simulations, we need to discretize our problems. And this is something that will appear over and over in this talk, that's why I'm putting it here. Otherwise, I, don't, I try not to get too technical, but um, this basically is just, so we have some continuous field, and uh, I mean, to describe this field, we will discretize it into a finite amount of elements. And for example, we can just use uh, particles of the same mass if we interpret this as a density field, and then where it's denser, so where it's darker, we have more particles per unit area, and where it's less dense, we have less particles per unit area. Okay, and our simulations themselves will only deal with the particles. They will only see how these particles work. Okay, so I talked about how um, dark matter doesn't interact with light, and because it doesn't interact with light, so it doesn't do electromagnetic interactions, it also doesn't collide with itself as normal matter does. Uh, so we have a collisionless system, and, uh, which is only influenced by gravity. And uh, it's a good approximation to just say everything in the universe is just something like dark matter, it's just collisionless, um, only um, gravitationally influenced matter, and we'll see where this takes us. And the problem um, <coughs> that this is uh, can be, is called the n-body problem, that's why these simulations are called n-body simulations. And basically, it's just the question, how do these n bodies, so these particles, for example, uh, that only interact via gravity, how do they behave over time? And we all know from high school physics, we have some gra Newton's gravitational law, and we don't need GR at this point because we're far from the limits where GR would be of any relevance to us. Um, but we basically have to see how n particles act on these n particles. And as I've written down here, just because, I mean, in the end, we're at a technology and computer-focused uh, Congress, um, usually this calculation would scale as O n squared, but we can make this much faster using smart uh, codes like uh, particle mesh, which use fast Fourier transforms or tree codes and so on to get it to n log n, and then some newer codes even uh, implement methods um, in O n. So, just for the people that are interested in this. Okay, then uh, let's get to, the, <laughs> to an early example of this, because people have been trying to solve this problem for quite some time, even before they had computers. And this is more the, for the hacker and tinkering uh, part of the audience, because Mr. Holmberg here, Eric Holmberg, uh, in 1941, um, also tried to solve this problem. And he mostly was concerned with this 1 over d squared thing in there. And, um, I mean, many things scale as 1 over d squared. For example, the light intensity from a light bulb. So he set up a system of uh, little elements with a light bulb and a photoreceptor. And that were, those were his particles. And then he basically measured how much light from the other particles were reaching every given particle and could this way evolve the system. And 
he actually got pretty good results with that. So, and with a lot of student work, of course, because there was a lot of manual work back then. Um, <laughs> but so he has two galaxies. Actually, a problem that we'll revisit, uh, or that I mean, it's often used in, in this uh, field of study, uh, and we'll see later on. But we had two galaxies, and as they cross or uh, came close to each other and interacted, they formed these tidal tails you see here. And this is a picture from a real galaxy taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is how actually galaxy looks li look like. I mean, this is pure work of gravity and, and uh, yeah, Newtonian dynamics. And then when people had computers, they revisited this problem. Uh, Tumri and Tumri, uh, uncle and nephew, wrote this paper together. And um, yeah, we again see these tidal tails. Um, yeah, and even nowadays, um, uh, some people look at simulations like that, not necessarily for the tidal tails, because it's kind of solved, but for other questions. OK, but we're actually interested in the whole universe, right? So we look at cosmological in-body simulations. And um, we don't start with the galaxies here, but we actually start with the power spectrum. So what we're actually doing, we're not um, simulating our universe because in the end, our, the cosmic microwave background is billions of light years away, uh, because it was billions of years ago. So we just cr create an initial density field with the same statistic, with the same power spectrum, so with the same amount of fluctuations on different scales as we measure in our universe. Um, and while nowadays you can do, maybe you come a bit closer, as I will show in the end of the talk, to our universe, um, that is what we do for the most part. And just to give you a feeling how this, such an n-body simulation looks like, I want to show you this quick video, which is just a 2D simulation. So we're not in 3D yet, we're just 2D, because then it's easier to understand. This was done by a colleague of mine, Jens Stücker. And you basically see how in slightly underdense regions the particles flow out and where you had these slight overdensities, the particles flow in. And then at some point, they meet each other, down here, for example, and they flow through each other, and they cross. And we get this system of, um, of filaments and nodes. Um, and remember this first video? We also had this system of filaments and nodes. Of course, in 3D, it's a bit different, because after one crossing, you get some two-dimensional structure. You get a sheet. And then after second crossing only, you get a filament, because then you have collapsed two dimensions and you're left with one dimension. And then when you collapse it in uh, more dimensions, then, for example, down here, also now we collapse two dimensions in 2D, and three dimensions would collapse three dimensions, you get what we call halos. And halos are um, the birthplaces of galaxies, because they're the densest dark matter structures, and um, there the gas flows in, and then the galaxies um, both well, stars and the galaxies that make up this, uh, and the stars that make up the galaxies form in there. Sorry. Um, yeah, but we're also not the first to do this, of course. I mean, people in the 70s already did this, and this is a video that a colleague of mine in, unearthed in uh, Estonia from the USSR, and where um, Doroshkevich and his co workers already did this in the uh, 70s, and then must have projected it on some screen and filmed it with some camera from the screen. <laughs> and, but you already see the same structure, basically, as we've just seen. And we can jump a bit forward. So there, um, if we jump here, they also did the same problem, basically, that we just showed as a toy example. And I mean, that's uh, by now, uh, what, 41 years ago? And um, they even had quite realistic uh, like cosmological density fields. Uh, but, I mean, in 2D here, but nevertheless. So what I'm working with still, despite this having been run in 2005, but there's just a lot of information in there that we can still um, investigate, is the Millennium Simulation, which, was, uh, which is very important for the field, because at the time it was the largest simulation, and it was um, very influential in the development. And this uses uh, so rough, a bit more than 10 billion particles in 2005. Um, and each particle represents um, something like a billion solar masses. So one solar mass is one sun, and a billion of them is one particle. And we have 10 billion particles in the simulation. And um, the box is 500 megaparsec. So we always have this, uh, let's just ignore this over H here. Um, and one parsec is a bit more than three light years. 
and uh, megaparsec is then a bit more than three million light years, so, um, and we have 500 of them on each side. As you will notice, actually, we have one gigaparsec here. Uh, in this picture of the slice, this is because the people did a very smart trick of basically unfolding this box for this picture so that it doesn't repeat. Um, but then this video shows us a flight into this thing, into the simulation, and we'll see how much structure is actually resolved. And at this point, um, so this is actually a good, nice place to stop. Here you can see a lot of things already. So you see this network, which is called the cosmic web, and you see the nodes in there. Where This is where large clusters of galaxies form, and here are smaller clusters or groups. You have empty regions, the voids, and you have filaments. This is where also a lot of galaxies uh, live, and which are traced then by basically these linear, um, oh, linear um, arrangements of galaxies. And then let's jump forward a bit. Uh, so now we're zooming into this thing, and we, we still see structure, right? We started with like thousands of megaparsec, now we're to single megaparsec, and there's still structure. And um, that is, to me at least, absolutely fascinating that we can see that much in a simulation. Um, nowadays, of course, computers get bigger, simulations get bigger. Um, this is from last year. It's one of the biggest that I know of. It's a two trillion particle simulation, so a two with 12 zeros. And uh, this is used for a future satellite mission, basically, to have some data that you can already analyze before the mission is running and to learn how to analyze the data from this mission. And uh, again, here you see, um, you kind of see these little um, density peaks, um, the halos. And that's a very useful abstraction because they are the birthplace of galaxies. And uh, I already told you some of these things. So halos are these gravitationally collapsed dark matter objects. And um, we really would like to know a lot about halos. And they are basically the core outcome of these simulations, the core result of these simulations, to know about how the halos are distributed, how they look like, and so on. Because how, how a halo, halo looks like and how it was formed um, tells us about the galaxy that was formed in there. And so here we. I, just chose this picture um, because it nicely shows this process of going from a part of the density field with all these density peaks in here, and then we separate it into a main halo and a lot of subhalos, and then basically we're mostly interested in this abstracted picture, of course not necessarily in a plot, but in a, as an abstracted data analysis uh, kind of way of thinking. Um, and then we want to know how these halos uh, what they look like and how they were formed. Um, and to define these, there are various methods. So in the 80s, people started with what they call friends of friends halo finders. I also worked with them for quite some time, which basically just collect, uh, like cluster or politics. I think people from machine learning will also know these uh, algorithms as cluster finders. And then there's another one, spherical overdensity finders, which just look for um, overdensity peaks or density peaks and then grow spheres around them until they reach a certain minimum density and stop. But modern halo finders, for example, Rockstar by Peter Beruzzi, um, they're much more complex and they don't only work on the positions, but they also take uh, the v full uh, phase space, so including the velocities into account and so on. Um, yeah, but I also uh, told you that we're interested in how the halos form, and that is encoded in here, and this is uh, what's called a merger tree. Um, basically, because halos don't form just from accreting diffuse material, but they also form from ha halos merging. And this is what we see here. So this halo today was formed from all these different halos. And I mean, you see all these little halos here, basically, which at some point in time, so this is time looking backwards from today, merged with this halo and make up this halo. Okay, so what is one of the well, uh, yeah, most uh, prominent and most important outcomes of these simulations that uh, we didn't know about before, actually, is uh, what's called the NFW profile after the discoverers Navarro, Frank, and White, which discovered it in 1996 in simulations. And this is very remarkable because um, they found that no matter the, the mass of the halo, uh, 
all the density profiles, so basically how the density be, uh, evolves as you go outwards, can be described to a very good degree uh, with two parameters. This RS and rho. And R is basically how far out you are. And so you have a you have a um, r to the minus 1 slope in the center, and then at some point at rs, you go over to an r to the minus 2 slope, and you have some normalization factor. And that's actually quite remarkable. And this has also been um, tested with observations and uh, has, uh, yeah, has worked very well so far. Of course, there's slight deviations in certain cases, but it's, it's a very good model. And it was not theoretically predicted before. I mean, people had ideas, but how they look, should look like, but that it really is that uh, was unclear before the uh, bigger n-body simulations in the 90s. And we can also, I don't have really time to talk about how, but we can populate these dark matter-only simulations despite not having gas in there with galaxies through using these merger trees and um, the masses of the halos and so on. So just through dark, this dark matter information, which basically represents dark matter and gas, we can populate them with galaxies, and then compare these galaxy populations with um, real observations of galaxies. And in the uh, top left part of this plot, um, we see um, real observations. So people going out there, taking the telescopes, measuring positions of galaxies in distance and on the sky. And we can do this in the simulation. This is in the Millennium Simulation, and do it in the same fashion. And we see we, there's not a big difference. I mean, it really looks the same. So we are on the right track there. And uh, this is also why, for example, these mock simulations for these uh, bigger, uh, or for this satellite, this Euclid satellite that I showed you before, why they do these simulations, because basically you can do this analysis already in simulations to then do the analysis later on with the real data. OK. Um, we, can, we can even compare this more quantitatively. So here we have the correlation function. So basically, how many? So I take a, a certain kind of uh, galaxy in this case, and look how many other galaxies of this kind, or how many other objects uh, I expect at a certain radius. So we have the radial distance here, and now this is this. But it doesn't really matter what it shows in detail. What I want to show you is that in the dots are the measured values from the a very important SDSS survey, and in red we have different kinds of populating the simulation uh, with galaxies, but um, it works really well, even if we split galaxies whether, uh, into red and blue, and if we go to different masses, so this is a factor of a thousand in mass between here and here, um, so this works really well. But still, I mean, we're treating everything as a collisionless um, fluid, um, and that's not really right. So if there is gas in the universe. There is normal matter in the universe. I'm mean, a living testament of that. So um, we um, are going to hydrodynamic simulations because we need hydrodynamics at some point because we actually want to know how the gas behaves. And these hydrodynamic simulations, um, for us today, they're only going to have these four ingredients. Um, we need, so apart from gravity, of course, I mean, gravity is still in there. It's still the most important part. We need to model the hydrodynamics. We need to see how we form stars in there, because that's, in the end, what we see. And uh, how we treat the supermassive black holes, because it, uh, and at the center of galaxies, because it turns out they're actually quite important to what we see in these galaxies. And how the stars and the supermassive black holes act back on their host galaxies and how they um, form them. And there are more phenomena that are included nowadays in most simulations, but as I said, time does not permit treating them. Okay, so uh, Eulerian hydrodynamics is the first way of treating hydrodynamics. So we just discretize space this time into a grid, and we have, because we have some regions where we need more spatial resolution than in others, uh, we have a nested hierarchy of grids in there, and there are codes today that still use them. Uh, or not still use them, but that do use them. For example, Ramses and Enzo, um, two codes that are very um, important in the field. And, um, but this basically, yeah, as I said, discretizes space. But before we discretized mass, we can also do this for hydrodynamics. Um, we basically divide our gas up into particles or, um, or um, yeah, moving cells. And um, so the first 
way of dealing with this that did this was, uh, it's called smooth particle hydrodynamics. I think many people will know this by now if they used Blender or something like this. I think they also have this in there. Many other fields use this. So basically you have a particle that represents a certain amount of gas and then you have some kernel function which smooths this particle and then these, you let these smooth particles interact. And um, another way that we're going to look a bit more in detail at in a second, or I just give you a little example of, is an unstructured mesh, mesh where you have these generator points, then you calculate a Voronoi tessellation, then you know which cells are neighboring each other, and then you, a bit like in the Eulerian hydrodynamics, you let stuff flow from one cell to the other, but you basically um, um, refine or de-refine de your grid uh, to keep the cells as at roughly the same mass. And then there are uh, new techniques which have particles again, which look similar and um, which are then called meshless methods because they don't really have this, these cells and meshes, but um, yeah, they just look the same. Um, okay, so just to give you a quick example of how this looks like, on the left is a very bad resolution example where you can actually see the cells using this uh, technique here in the middle, this uh, moving mesh which is also used in the simulations that I'm going to show you further on and that I showed you in the first video. Um, and just to give you a feeling of what this looks like. So we have a flow to the right and a flow to the left. That you can see this as cool and this as hot. And we see the cells in the center are very square and they move with the flow. And at the surface, they deform. And you see how the stuff mixes in the cells and how the cells flow with the fluid. And um, this way, um, you basically, uh, this makes it often advantageous compa as compared to um, uh, Eulerian hydrodynamics. And then if you don't do this with bad resolution, but with a quite good resolution, and this is pretty much the same problem, a little bit, uh, with a little bit different initial condition, but uh, we see we get very nice results. We get a very nice um, yeah, kelvin helmholtz instability, which is the standard test of hydrodynamical codes, um, with these two fluids flowing through each other or by each other. And we see the level of details and vortices that we can track with this. OK, so this is hydrodynamics. We hope we have a good handle on that. Then what about stars and supermassive black holes? Problem is we can't resolve them. I mean, particles are still, I mean, even in good simulations, they're still way too big to track uh, single stars or to represent the space that actually is at the supermassive black holes. I mean, they're huge, but they're still really, really tiny compared to the dimensions of the simulation. So what we use are subgrid models, which are effective models, which basically tell us um, how the processes that we cannot resolve behave and how they act back on the scales that we do resolve. And so instead of resolving how all these single stars in this forming star cluster in the Andromeda galaxy, this, that's where this picture is from, actually um, form, we just have star particles which represent sometimes millions, sometimes thousands of stars. And um, then we have models how basically these, when these stars explode, how they feed back energy and momentum into the surrounding gas. The same happens for supermassive black holes. So here we have a multi-frequency composite image of, um, of a very active galaxy uh, where the supermassive black hole at the center drives out these jets and emits a lot of energy because, um, I mean, black holes do eat but they're very messy eaters, so when they eat, the um, material that falls in gets heated a lot, it radiates, and uh, also a lot of the materials actually spew, spew out again and um, imparts momentum on the surrounding gas. And um, how the supernova feedback looks like, I want to show you in this video run by Cha Yu Hu from MPA at the time, now in New York, and this gives you a face-on density map of a dwarf galaxy and uh, cut through this galaxy and we see stars forming and then exploding and forming these low density bubbles as they drive out the gas. And this is most important in small galaxies and dwarf galaxies because they're not massive enough to really keep all the gas in and they're the potential well, so the 
gravitational potential uh, is weak enough that these supernovas can really do a lot of damage. And um, as we see, it really reshaped this galaxy. Okay. On the other mass end of galaxies, we have very massive, supermassive black holes. And yeah, here I want to show you this video run by uh, Di Matteo and collaborators in 2005. And while the results are not scientifically 100% uh, up to date now, um, uh, but they're still very close to what's actually happening. And so we have two very massive galaxies, of which we can see the gas here, um, with the hue representing the temperature and the color, the density, if I remember correctly, um, interact, so fly by each other. That actually, remember the tidal tails that I showed you before? That's what's forming there right now. So we see these tidal tails, and we have supermassive black holes at the centers of these two galaxies. And at one point, they start eating a lot of this gas, which is um, driven on them as part of this collision, and it starts heating up, and we already see some outflows there. And then at some point, they really start um, releasing a lot of energy and driving out the gas. And if there's no gas, if there's no cool gas, which can form stars, which can gravitational collapse, it's hot again. I remember, as we talked about in the early universe, um, then we can't really form stars. And this also inhibits star formation in very massive galaxies. And um, we didn't always know that we needed these two processes, but um, observations told us that very massive and very low-mass galaxies don't form a lot of stars. And what we see here is actually the mass of stars divided by the mass of the, of the dark matter halos of the system. So the, um, as a proportional to the uh, mass of normal matter in the universe divided by the matter of the universe. So basically this is a question, how much available gas in the universe is actually turned into stars in galaxies? And uh, we see that here, we see the mass of the galactic system, so dark matter halo plus the galaxy inside, but it's mostly just the dark matter halo. Um, and we see that at the low mass end, stellar feedback, so mostly supernovae, uh, really decreases uh, this amount of gas that is formed into stars, the proportional amount, and at the high mass end. And here, these colorful curves are observations. This red and black one is an older simulation, um, which actually doesn't get this top end perfectly right. But um, we'll see a video of the refined model, uh, which does much better than this. Um, but nonetheless, um, we see this trend already here. And we, in our galaxy, the Milky Way, live here, in the, roughly at the sweet spot, where we form the most stars. But even there, we only turn 25% of the theoretically available gas into stars. Um, OK, as I told you that nowadays, galaxy simulation, or these cosmological hydrodynamic simulations do much better. And so I want to show you some results from the illustrious TNG, this is from the illustrious simulation, the illustrious TNG, because apparently people like Star Trek, um, uh, do much better. And this is just a little gallery of all the different kinds of galaxies they form, and they look pretty realistic. And if you, at some point we can also look at, in another talk, at more quantitative plots, but also quantitatively they do much better. And um, that's actually the simulation where this initial video came from. Um, and now I hope we uh, I may or I could explain to you why you see what you see. So here we see the gas density and temperature um, in this cosmological hydrodynamical simulation. We see the gas flowing into dark matter halos that formed and into this cosmic web structure formed by the dark matter. We see that um, not we, you don't see as many little bright spots as you saw in the dark matter simulation when we just showed these density maps because the small galaxies don't really can hold their gas. You see how from the big spots the gas is also driven out in these winds from the feedback. And you see things merging and forming bigger and bigger uh, lumps. And here we actually see something like a cluster of galaxies form. Yeah. And... Um, 
But it's still, of course, a bit hard to envision how this looks like in starlight. So um, let's look at this in a bit more quantitative fashion. Here we just have some slice uh, with uh, some slice projected into 2D with three panels, the gas density, what we saw just now, and the dark matter density, what we've seen, for example, for the um, millennium simulation before, and actually the stars. So this is what you would see if you could look out with your telescope and see very faint objects. And um, this again from the illustrious TNG simulation, and this is uh, run by Dylan Nelson, a colleague of mine, did these very nice uh, figures. And so let's run them for a bit. We see how the dark matter structure forms, and then the gas follows this already much more structured dark matter. And then we see over here how stars created. And sometimes you can even see, let's maybe go back to the beginning of the video, you can see how these single stellar particles pop up here. And later on, there's enough star formation that you don't see these single events anymore. And um, yeah, we see how this um, structure forms. And this already looks a bit like, if you remember this plot from the very beginning, um, um, with um, these actual galaxy surveys, we see this, this web structure, and, uh, but we also see that galaxies only trace it quite sparsely. So um, for the most, most of this dark structure is hidden from us, and we also don't directly see the gas, but we could, for example, observe it if we have uh, very powerful light sources behind it and then see how, as the light pierces through the gas, is changed in its properties. And dark matter, for example, we can see if we, um, maybe someone else is uh, give a talk at some point about this here, gravitational lensing, how basically the gravitational force of the dark matter bends the light around it and, um, and uh, distorts the galaxy images that are behind the structure. Okay. Um, so what are people doing nowadays? So what's, what's happening at the moment in this field? Um, of course, things get bigger. Things always get bigger with computers. So um, um, uh, we started here in the 90s. Um, even before, we had a few. So this is the number of resolution elements, so particles or cells or something like this, so n-body particles or hydro cells and so on. And we started with uh, 10 to 100,000. And nowadays, yeah, we're in the in billion, tens of billion range. Um, and body simulations were always faster because gravitation, just calculating gravity is much faster than also doing all these other calculations. Um, but they actually track each other quite well. This is from a, a publication by Gannel in 2014, so we don't have the most recent developments on here. Um, but as things get bigger, they also get much harder to save. Um, so the Millennium simulation, um, use roughly 300 gigabytes per snapshot just for a particle data. Then if you have data products, it gets much bigger. And we have 64 snapshots, so that's roughly 18 terabyte that we need to save if we want to keep it. Um, this Euclid flagship simulation, I calculated if you would save it as the Millennium Simulation, of course you can trick a bit, and then, do, and then but then it would be 60 terabytes per snapshot. If we have 60 snapshots, this would be 3.6 petabyte. Um, which I guess is not, I mean, yes, I think we can save it at our institute maybe three times or so, but then our storage is full. Um, so the solution is we don't really save everything. So uh, we produce these halo catalogs that I talked about before. So we look for the halos on the fly and write those things out and um, how they merge into each other and so on. And we only record data on a light cone because, um, I mean, you saw this before when I showed you this plot in the beginning of the history of the universe. As the light reaches us, it basically, light from further away places uh, reaches us um, later. So we see into the past as we look out. And so basically we record on a light cone as if the light would go through the simulation box and just record the particle data on this light cone. And then we have basically a simulated observation from a certain point in this simulation box. Okay, um, they also get stronger. They have more physical processes included. Um, things that I didn't talk about, but for example, radiation, magnetic fields are already included in the uh, illustrious TNG and illustrious simulation. Cosmic rays, dust, 
dust, um, stars produce dust, and dust couples gas and um, uh, uh, yeah, radiation. And in the end, there's a lot more processes that we can follow, which also increase um, computational complexity. And as we increase our resolution, we decrease what we have to consider sub subgrid. So in this uh, simulation of the supernova in this galaxy, I mean, the star particles were, I think, 10 solar masses or so. And in other simulations, um, they would have to be thousands or hundreds of thousands of solar masses and so on. So sometimes you actually resolve single stars in this very high, um, so the very massive stars you would resolve as a single particle in these simulations. And they become faster um, because, but I mean, this being faster is then translated into we make them bigger, so they're as slow as before because we have the same lifetime as a researcher, but we now have more computational time. Um, and um, we also include more things in them. But of course, also the codes get faster, as I talked, uh, talk, told you about before. I mean, we, uh, when we talked about how this n-body problem, there are faster and faster methods, and, and the codes become just much more efficient. And we also have new codes that maybe solve certain problems in a more specialized but faster way. Um, but as computers uh, become bigger, uh, scaling becomes more of a problem because we don't just use uh, one com core in the beginning or maybe a few hundred or a few thousand, but now we come into the scale where... So I talked once about uh, running something on the Tianhe computer, so I think that's one point something million cores or so? I, I forgot. But anyway, so we're talking about massive numbers of cores that have to work together. And uh, so scaling becomes a major concern. And so right now, all, most of these simulations are uh, programmed in this typical MPI OpenMP paradigm where you have MPI for the inter-process communication and then on a node you have OpenMP threads that do most of the work, sometimes just MPI um, with uh, one process per core. Um, but uh, people move away from there and work with computer scientists and uh, specialists from big uh, HPC vendors to um, get faster and better um, uh, algorithms uh, into these simulations. And as they become faster, there's one more thing that I wanted to show you. Um, we can actually do uh, interesting things with them, and this is something that Jens Jasche who used to be at my institute and is now in Stockholm, um, does um, where he basically tries to, in a certain sense, fit n-body simulations to our local universe. So where he basically calculates an n-body simulation in a quick way and um, then perturbs the initial conditions in such a way that he comes closer and closer to the real outcome. And here on the right, you see in dark his den simulated density field and in red actually galaxies from a real galaxy survey, and they match really well. Okay, there are some parts where they don't really match, but most, for the most part, they match really, really well. And then he knows from where he started, so this is on a shell 100 megaparsec around us, uh, and so this way he can unravel the initial conditions of our own universe. And there are also other uh, groups um, that do similar undertakings, for example, in Potsdam, and, um, and it, different way, but with similar method, or, or, or with a similar goal. Yeah, and I think also for this uh, audience, quite interesting, um, this field is becoming increasingly open, but it's already quite open in the sense that um, the codes are to a large degree uh, public. Uh, some codes, I mean, some parts of the codes are not necessarily public, but a lot of the big codes try to be as public as, as they deem possible. Um, so you can just go to uh, GitHub or whatever and just look for these codes and run simulations yourself. They have some small working examples and you can toy around with them. I mean, you don't really have a supercomputer, but you can still do some nice little exercises. Uh, the simulation results are often made public. So um, they actually want you to use the data. I mean, you as a scientist now that uh, produces relevant citations. and um, that really helps um, make the simulations known and gets more value out of the simulations because more people can actually work on them. And uh, here, again, I want to give the Millennium uh, run the Millennium simulation as an example. Um, so in 2000, 
18, I'm still working on this. This was run in 2005 when I was, uh, I turned 14. And um, today, or the last time I checked, there were 974 publications that used the data from this simulation for this publication. I mean, some of them were just on the simulation, some compared it with others. But um, yeah, I think that's a pretty impressive number. And um, yeah, that's really interesting. And you can also look at those things yourself. I mean, they're, they're on the web in the end. Um, sometimes you have to register and uh, maybe tell them why you want to look at these things. But um, so there's cosmosyn.org run by people from Potsdam, the Millennium Database um, from Durham and, and the MPA in Garching, where I work. Cosmohop, I think it's in the ETH. Um, and the illustrious TNG database from this illustrious collaboration, also MPA and Harvard and some other institutions that are involved there. And so the illustrious TNG was actually publicly released on the 14th of December. So uh, it's pretty new on the web now. Um, but you can look at the Halo catalogs and you can look at uh, yeah, all the um, interesting outcomes of these simulations. And um, with this, I want to leave you with my take home messages. I hope I could, uh, yeah, um, explain to you why um, cosmological simulations are really powerful tools and um, for cosmology and galaxy formation in these cosmos cosmologies and how um, they predict also some previously unknown things that we, uh, for example, this NFW profile that we didn't really know about before. and. Um, also, they're quite robust in terms of the gravity. And also, um, I mean, we've seen there was some evolution still between, for example, illustrious and illustrious TNG, but they're also getting better and better in this respect. And um, that they're huge computational undertakings. Um, and that they're very nice examples of how science and its results can be made public and the way to get to these results as well. And yeah, and if you want to mo know more about the physical side of these things, there's, uh, there's going to be a great talk by Sarah Conrad from Heidelberg, who's going to talk about dark matter and dark energy on day four uh, at 10 past two in Borg. And yeah, I'll definitely go there, and I hope I'll see many of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, if you would like to leave at this point, please do that very quietly so that people can still enjoy the Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please line up in the microphones uh, in the room. We have a question from the internet. Signal Angel, please. The reason for the simulation results embargo. Sorry? What is the reason for the simulation results embargo? Oh, because, I mean, if you run the simulation, you also want to be the first to call dibs and use the results for some time. I mean, they still invite people, and, but they have these project pages where they basically say, okay, I want to do this with the simulation, some other in the cover collaboration wants to do this other project with the simulation, and um, that's basically that you just want to reap the fruits of your own labor. All right, thanks. Thank you. Microphone number two. Um, yeah, as far as I understood, uh, these uh, simulations are not as granular as to predict the behavior of uh, individual stars, or no. are they? No. Okay. Um, how far along will it approximately be until this is possible, and also um, uh, and also uh, factors like uh, the different classes, uh, star classes of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Yeah, no, I mean there are. Flow into I mean, so that was something that I had in the talk that I threw out again. So there are, of course, simulations that simulate how star clusters form. So there are simulations even that simulate how a single star evolves in 3D or in how it explodes as a supernova. Um, but I think it's not the, um, uh, it's not really, not every simulation has to do everything at the same time. I mean, you can have specialized simulations that look on a certain length scale and then use the information, and that's also what people try to do, to use information from that length scale then in a model that you can basically use as a subgrid model in larger simulations, for example. Thank you. Um, please try to limit your questions to a single sentence. Microphone number one, please. Hi, and thank you. Uh, 
of all the particles in our physical universe having mass. Uh, is every particle able to interact with every other particle? Um, no. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone number four. So in all your uh, simulations, is there kind of sometimes a steady state that simulation goes to and then just, just doesn't go any further in terms of changes? Or is it you know, always um, changing? No, I don't think so, because I mean, you have an accelerated expansion. So, um, Well, it could be that it reaches equilibrium for some reason or the other. So it doesn't Not that I know question. of. Not okay. for any reason that I know of. And of course, sorry, um, so who, just for the question right now, I mean, yeah, it doesn't interact via all interactions. Of course, if it has mass, it will interact via gravity. Uh, yeah, sorry, just to finish up this question. All right, microphone number three, your question. Um, yeah, so as you said, um, the models have been scaling up um, um, all yeah, during the last decades. Um, are there actually questions that could be answered by just a bigger model? So does it really make sense to go bigger and bigger all the time? It improves your statistics. Basically, um, you get more extreme environments. So basically, if you have a bigger box, so for example, these smaller um, uh, hydrodynamic simulations often don't have very massive clusters in them, just because clusters are very massive clusters of galaxies are rare. And then sometimes you form one in them, if you're lucky, with your initial conditions, but you can't really predict that because you haven't run the simulation yet. And then um, sometimes you don't. And so bigger boxes basically help you to get all these different environments sampled and um, the same for the largest voids and so on. You don't have the largest voids in a small box because sometimes your box is smaller than the largest void. Thanks. Uh, microphone number one, your question. Hi, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, my question is, what is the time scale at which the simulations are run? Um, meaning, so you, you basically start the simulation from this uh, image of the temporal, uh, temperature scan, right? And then yeah. you run it for, I don't know how much. So could it be that we just run, uh, compared to the life of the universe, the simulation for like a very tiny? No, 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 uh, no. You, so you run it. Okay. So you don't run it, A, you don't run directly from this image because in the beginning you can do analytical approximations, but then at some point those break down and then you have to really do these calculations. Um, but then you usually run them until today. Mm -hmm. So um, also this video that I showed you, it runs from when the universe, so just the video shows you the part uh, of, of the simulation that runs from when the universe was uh, a fifth of its current volume and then um, and then until today, basically. That's what you usually, I mean, sometimes people miscalculate their computing time and then they run out of computing time and then they don't get there. That's always a bit um, annoying, but some, pe some simulations are even constructed that way because they're not interested in today. They're only interested in the high redshift universe, meaning the old universe. So, um, for example, just, yeah, the process of the first, how the first uh, stars and, and galaxies form, and then you don't really want it to run that far down because you have enough simulations showing that part. Thank you. All right, single angel question from the internet. Now my question from the internet is, um, is it possible to simulate backwards instead of changing star parameters until they match um, what we observe in, your uni in our universe? Um, not so, not, no. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, microphone number two, your question. Yeah. So regarding research about fitting certain, uh, uh, you know, like uh, simulations into our coding obs uh, current observations, would it be possible, um, how many initial states could yield the current uh, observations that we have? Like, not, not only the sheer number, but uh, because that's probably infinite, but yeah. uh, could two completely different initial states, like, completely random and having no connection whatsoever yield the same state, like converge? Um, the exact same? Um, no. no, I mean two completely different initial states uh, converging into, a, you know, into some state after the simulation that closely resembles our current observations. Or do they have some common pattern? 
Well, I mean, if the large scale fluctuations are yeah. very different, then no, I don't think so. But um, it's a good question. I might have to think about this. All right. Thank you, Philip. That unfortunately is the last question we have with time. Um, please give him a huge round of applause for that excellent talk. <laughs>